keeping permanent daylight savings time or permanent standard time. And I got a mixed, uh, I, I think I got a majority, a few people said, I don't care, just don't make us change it, either way. <laughs> <laughs> but I th uh, people are, seem to be ready in my highly scientific survey of about 25 people <laughs> to just fix the time, one or the other. And there, there is a bill that looks like it's going to pass that would give us permanent daylight savings time. And uh, would, not, would not be enacted until both Oregon and Washington State do it. And that's, I, I think California has passed it. But uh, Washington State has a process. And then you need congressional approval. So like any of these, seems like a pretty simple thing, right? Not, but, uh, but there's interest in that. I, I, so that's one of the sort of what do you think issues. Um, another was 16-year-old voting age, and I was kind of surprised to get a large majority of no on that. So. No. <laughs> Raise your hand if you're 16 years old. <laughs> yeah. So those are all the controversial issues in Salem, and now I'll turn What about self-pumping gas? Oh, that's right. <laughs> Uh, well, I think that, that families and communities are almost evenly divided on the issue of self-pump. Um, how many want self-pump? Raise your hand. Self-serve. Self-serve. Self 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 yeah. Nobody? Yeah. Almost nobody? Yeah. Okay. Well, that's interesting yeah. then. So, yeah. so your opinion about self-serve gas, yes? No? No! no. no. You know, what's interesting about that issue, it used to be about, are you going to spill it and is it a safety hazard? Now, when it comes up, and I don't know of a bill in this issue, but there is when, a bill. There is a bill. When, when it comes up, um, you hear from the major oil companies because they, the profit center for the big gas stations is the, the, the store, the quick stop or whatever. And if, you, if we have self-serve, you just might serve yourself and get out. But if you stop and are served, you're much more likely to go on the street. No, that's, that's, that's <laughs> It provides a lot of jobs. What's that? Right. A job? Job. That's got to say, jobs for people getting out of the jail and stuff like that. It's a great place to get Yeah, three little jobs. Yeah. Um, so let's go from here to the smaller issues like the climate bill. Uh, I thought we'd talk about maybe climate and. Uh, and fire, wildfire, yes. and uh, revenue, the big picture of how much money are we going to raise, which translates to what, what are we going to do about Oregon services, and maybe a little on universal health care. And I'd like, I'm going to ask Pam to talk about wildfire policy, because she's really gotten in the, herself in the center of things there. And then let's open the floor and see what you'd like to talk about. So the climate bill, House Bill 2020, as you may know, is a huge enterprise. It's been, you know, in one form or another, it's been in the legislature three plus sessions where there was an interim committee that worked on it and worked on it and worked on it. Both Pam and I are what uh, is, is on what has been called the Carbon Reduction Committee, but I think that name is changing soon. And um, it is a massive and complicated effort. I, I wish it were easier to talk about and explain. Um, but it recently, from it was, we had an initial bill at the beginning of the session. Last week was called an omnibus package of amendments was introduced, and just the amendments ran 129 pages. Um, so you probably know it's a cap and trade program that's modeled largely out of what California has done, and would charge major emitters, um, or give major, give or sell major emitters allowances or permits, one for every ton of carbon dioxide equivalent they put in the air, but only only uh, the larger emitters. And then there, a, a market develops such that if they can find ways to emit less and less, they still have these allowances which they can sell on the open market. And then there, there are other, other um, features, things called offsets, where you can uh, fund a, a project elsewhere 
that is reducing carbon dioxide emissions as part of this market. And the idea is to be part of a market that includes California, a couple Canadian provinces, a market that's growing. Um, there's a, you know, there's so much complexity around the so-called carbon market world. There are a lot of different methods, a lot of argument about what's best, but ba basically this gives an incentive to reduce emissions fast and then takes that revenue and spends it in large part making sure that economically uh, disadvantaged communities, communities of color, uh, people on the economic edge are not hurt by this. We will see some, uh, if this passes, some increase in gas prices. We will, uh, there's a utilities bill issue where, where we, people need to be protected from that. There are issues about people living in rural areas who have to drive a long ways. So that we need to make sure that uh, the, the challenges with, the, uh, with transition don't fall uh, unacceptably on people who can't afford them. Then there's also a whole, it used to be called the Clean Energy Jobs Bill. The whole uh, belief, and it's, it's, it's holding true in places around the world, is that um, you can incentivize and put capital into new enterprises around clean energy, clean energy jobs. And in fact, yes, there will be economic challenges, but there will also be huge economic opportunities. Uh, and that's what a transition is about. We, you know, the basic uh, decision is we have a responsibility to move fast on reducing carbon emissions. And yes, it, it's a, in my view, a tragedy the national government's not willing to do this and it makes it harder for states. But that doesn't give us the luxury of saying, well, let's wait till other states do it or we, we need to do what we can and hopefully build a model that other states want to copy until we, we reach a critical mass in this country. But like any transition, this is a huge transition. There are, uh, there's some pain and there's some gain. There, there are uh, people invested in the current economy who are going to have some real challenges and we have to address that. And there will be uh, new opportunities that have played out a lot in other states. So, uh, briefly, and you can really go on and on and on about this, um, but briefly the amendments have made it, have brought in some of the industries that were exempted in the first uh, round. Uh, there's a category called energy intensive trade exposed businesses and industries. And the thought was um, if you make their costs of emissions too high, they won't be competitive and the economic uh, downside will be too big for Oregon. So now, so there were a whole bunch of them that were kind of exempted from the bill. Now they have to perform too, but what they have to do is prove that they are using the best available technology in the world. You know, basically they were saying, look, these are key industries, we need what they do, we need the jobs that, that they provide, and we're doing the best that we can. We're, we've, got, we've invested in the very best, lowest emissions technology there is, so what are you going to do? So basically we're saying, okay, we're going to hold you to that. And there, there are some other uh, uh, amendments that uh, have to do with uh, rebates for people who need it for uh, any natural gas uh, price increases. Um, you can go on and on. Those of you who are really interested in this, be happy to talk offline. There's now just the last few days some summaries of what the bill does that will be available for those of you who want to know that. So, um, yeah, go ahead, Kayla. Well, um, I'm listening to hear what your position is on cap and trade versus a uh, carbon tax or the um, tax uh, that would, is paid by big corporations would go back to low-income people to offset their increase in uh, so the, gasoline bills. That, uh, that's something called a fee and dividend, where you, you, you yeah. charge for those emissions. Yeah. And then actually, there's, a, there's one model where a check goes back to everyone, mm -hmm. and everybody benefits. And uh, before I came on the scene, there was a decision not to go that way. That one of the issues is we have to have a cap we have to make sure that the overall emissions don't go over a certain amount and, and have that cap reduced over time. And the um, what's called fee and dividend by itself doesn't have a cap. You could say, well, you know, they'll, they're going to reduce because it costs them to emit. But but the, the decision was made to have a very firm cap on this. Um, I, you know, personally, I think that there's some real merits to that, but it's not it's not going to get changed right now. And I, at the point that I came along, 
uh, benefiting from the work of a lot of people who've worked real hard. I'm, I am a supporter of this bill. I want to make sure that um, the economic problem for a number of communities and people is really seriously addressed. And I want to make sure there's a really rigorous way to invest the funds in places that will really produce uh, green energy and really produce family wage jobs. And I believe there's ways to do that. I want to see if Pam wants to add. She's also on the Sure. I think the problem with a, a uh, carbon tax is that we've just never seem to be effective in reducing emissions any place where it's been implemented. You know, generally you start off 15 to 20 dollars a, a metric ton. The evidence seems to show the number would have to be five or six times that to actually start impacting. Otherwise, cal uh, corporations actually like carbon taxes in many cases because they can calculate them into the cost of goods, pass that on to the consumer, but not change their practices. So this whole effort is just about reducing emissions. There'll be some resources that are generated as a result of the, of the cap and trade system. We want to invest those, as Jeff said, into our vulnerable communities, into forest work, into water. We can already see in Southern Oregon the impacts of climate change right in front of us. So those resources invested in those vulnerable, that vulnerable infrastructure will, frankly, get Oregon ahead of the curve um, in terms of looking at how we, how we survive and thrive in the decades to come. So I think, I mean, that's, that's my problem with the carbon taxes. we got to have something that works. Let, let me move on, and again, in your question, we're going to have, leave the bulk of the time for questions and comments, so if you want to return to that, that's fine. I know for a lot of people, me included sometimes, your eyes can blaze over when we get into the details of this. Um, I know a number of you uh, are, have worked really hard on uh, universal health care for Oregon, and the session started with a bill that's really a resolution. I, I think it's Senate Bill 770. I usually, one, one of the reasons I... Pam's, uh, I like to be around her, she remembers bill numbers. And <laughs> uh, so, uh, 770 was introduced by Senator James Manning from Eugene, and really it was a resolution that Oregon is committed to affordable quality health care and access for everyone. And what has happened is it's, it's been amended, so now that it is, it is rather than just the intention, it creates um, a study group that builds off uh, study that the Rand Corporation did some time ago and looks at where Oregon is now. There's, there's a belief that we are ahead of the game relative to most of the nation, partly because of our coordinated care organizations, partly because back in the Kitsauber days we started a system that ranks the importance of different health procedures uh, and, and the public health benefit. And that's, that's further than other states have gotten. So this study over the next few months would describe in great detail how do we get there? How do we get from here to affordable universal <coughs> health care in Oregon? So there's a hearing on that Monday where I'll be testifying. That, that's where that's at right now. So we won't see a systematic change this session. It's, uh, it's like, that was it Donald, Donald Trump who said, who knew health care was complicated? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes? Yeah, I just have a question. I keep hearing the term. Health care would actually be Disease care. I mean, legal health care has to do with preventing disease. Indeed. And if you work with a bill like that, it should really emphasize prevention rather than waiting for people to need a. You're right. And so, you're absolutely right. Healthier people, more affordable care. It's true. And I mentioned before the prioritized list, and that doesn't get much publicity anymore. It was a big deal when at the time Senator John Kitzhaber and others. Alan Bates, before his legislative career, worked on this too. <coughs> Travel around the country, the, the state for over a year, hearing from thousands of Oregonians and created this list. And towards the top of this list, the things we're going to find first are largely preventive. Preventative, sorry. So the, in that way, Oregon's got the message that you're giving more than most other states. <coughs> yeah. Yeah. Did you? Yeah. yeah. Um, my concern about state controlled health care is that the state tends to get controlled by the pharmaceutical companies and there's a lot of us that like to go for alternative uh, remedies that are not you know chemical and radiation based and if everything gets consolidated uh, centralized that's where you get the corruption and the big money control in my life and that's what I don't want. I hear that. Yes. Yeah, I hear that. We should, on the subject of healthcare, we should acknowledge
large, one of the really big votes that we have taken during this session, and that is to put together a substantial amount of the funding that we need to maintain our Medicaid system. You know, when we expanded Medicaid a few years ago, or OHP as we call it here in the state of Oregon, Oregon Health Plan, um, now we have about a million Oregonians, including 400,000 children, on Oregon Health Plan. And as we came into the session, we have an $800 million gap in the budget. Um, that is the monies that Oregon needs to come up in order to match a significant um, number of more dollars that come from the federal level. So we've taken a couple votes. Um, we took a vote to continue, in a, in a slightly different form, a provider tax that is paid by hospitals and other health care vendors. <coughs> that match goes up to the fed, federal level, comes back to us with even more dollars that we can invest in health care. So it's a good deal for everybody. Um, and secondly, we continued in a slightly different form a surcharge on uh, certain insurance premiums. Um, so that money goes into the pot, it makes up roughly half of that $800 um, million dollar hole. Right now, uh, in the budget that's pending out there, the rest of the hole is made up by general fund. But what we're hoping is over the next couple of weeks that we will look at a cigarette tax, which could generate a significant amount of money toward that hole, perhaps as much as $350 million. That would be two bucks a pack, and you all may I'm sure you have some opinions about that. Um, and then the other piece would be a surcharge on large corporations that um, employ people but don't provide any kind of health care in situations where those employees are getting their health care through the Oregon Health Plan. So the intent would be to engage those corporations through a surcharge that allows them to contribute to the cost of Oregon Health Plan, a benefit to their own employees. But I think the good news is here is we are figuring out how to, we in Oregon are figuring out how to keep our Medicaid system whole, to keep those million people. And I have to say, in terms of the, the notion of prevention, one of the really great things about the current structure of our Oregon Health Plan is that it's really moving toward a prevention-based model through our coordinated care organizations, um, which are rewarding those upstream, uh, rewarding and addressing those upstream factors that keep us healthy before we ever get to a doctor's office. So we're we're slowly but surely kind of turning that healthcare model upside down. And I think our real challenge is to is to take that model and now figure out how to extend it or to pull people in to that publicly funded model so that we can again continue and spread this notion of prevention funding. And in connection with that and Eli's question now, there is a bill that I a house bill that I signed on to this week that would make sure that specifically acupuncture, massage therapy, and chiropractics get parity with other therapies when it comes to A lot of that has been driven by the opioid problem. People who weren't interested in a bill like that before are saying, we got to find other modalities of handling. So in some ways, it's moving in the right direction. And also, uh, in connection with Pam's comment about a tax on corporations who don't provide health care, there's also a bill, I, I don't know where it's going or how developed it is, called the Walmart bill. Yes. And yes. is it the same, same bill? bill? Yeah. So essentially, not just health care, but public benefits generally. The, the effort would be for corporations doing business here over a super, <coughs> certain size, assessing them the amount that their sort of underpayment of employees is costing us in public benefits. <laughs> I don't think that, that's the methodology, uh, that the methodology's totally worked out on that. But the idea is if you, if you, someone who works full time should be able to afford the basics. Radical concept. So, um, and you taxpayers should not be subsidizing Walmart employment. That's that's the notion. Yeah. Um, yes. So on the issue of health and uh, preventative care, uh, many in the community are concerned about uh, the issue of microwave radiation emitted from smart meters and cell phones. <laughs> and my question is, how will you two respond to the evidence of harm that's being presented? Actually, it was presented this week in the. Uh, Oregon State Senate Bill 281, Bill 282, Bill 283, which brings to um, attention the harm caused in schools where children are put on iPads 
almost continuously when they fin finish filling out a form, you know, paperwork, they, they're given their iPad. And European countries are showing in incredible harm from these devices, and yet we have no regulation. The FCC is not regulating. And on that note, 5G, Mayor Wheeler of Portland just helps a, a council session where they said they're going to work hard to prevent 5G from coming in. We really want to know what you... One of those three bills, am I right, uh, mandates uh, more study of 5G before... It's, it's allowed to uh, proliferate. Do, do I have that one of those? Um, I don't believe so. I believe it's the actual looking at the science <coughs> and the, the Bill 283 is going to be looking at the actual uh, effects on school children from their iPads. So. Okay, there's there's that and there is also 5G studies and I don't know which one of those three bills or not. I support those. My, my belief is that our tech, we are letting a number of things uh, uh, move into widespread use without adequate research on long-term health effects. So I'm, uh, there's a particular bill, the number I'm not going to remember, which on 5G specifically, that before there's deployment, and apparently a lot of things happen have to happen in the infrastructure before we really deploy 5G, and there's big investment in 5G technology. And um, I'd like to join other states demanding uh, much, much better national, nas nationally based research on 5G effects before we go forward. On, on radiation and um, or uh, wireless, use of wireless in schools, I know that is similar to some of that. I'm, I'm concerned, I share that concern. When you think about the amount of general radiation in the environment, I mean, uh, I'm pretty sure this, this works on waves, right? Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, it, they're everywhere. And um, it's not like there's no research, but the abundance of, of this has not been adequately studied, in my view. And 5G, if I understand right, is sort of a quantum leap to, to a much more intense uh, protocol. In schools, you know, I, it seems to me that um, in schools, at any rate, we could move to requirements of hardwiring rather than yeah. wiring. Yeah. 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 My good friend, uh, Pam Marsh, who has been working hard on rural, rural broadband, which I support, points out some complexities about that. So let me give you the good have a good I think um, first of all, we should acknowledge the FCC has, we may not like it, um, we may think they're doing a bad job, but the FCC is actually in charge of regulating and making uh, comments on the health impacts of all of these items, the smart meters, the, the, um, uh, the wireless applications, the antennas that are in your community, and ultimately 5G. So the law states that decisions cannot be predicated on health impacts at a local or state level. Now, the FCC, the FCC may not be doing a very good job of that, and I tend to think that they are not on top of their science. And what we need to do is really push our federal legislators to make sure that the FCC takes a broad look at all of the science and the impacts of multiple exposures, because I think that's the world that we're living in right now that's different than maybe in the past, is the multiple exposures, and actually issues some very good sound advice on that. Now, local communities can make decisions based on other factors. You can have, but they're very limited in, the, in terms of like antenna uh, imposition, or, and eventually, I, I think 5G is going to have some very limited factors as well. The FCC went down the path about six months ago, uh, made a decision that really limited a community's ability to regulate 5G. Now, all of that is tied up in courts. Our cities are fighting that because cities want to have the ability to regulate 5G on a local level or to have some say in what goes on. But we, I, I just want to convey the fact that in some ways our hands are a little limited around this right now because the FCC really holds, holds those cards. In terms of schools, you know, I, I think that's a difficult question. If you look at how any classroom works today and the um, ability for children to engage with technology, a lot of that is predicated on the pads that can move around the room, the devices that can go to any one corner, um, the ways that children can work in groups. Um, 
talk to a classroom teacher about how technology is used in the classroom in ways that really allow children to learn and practice and engage with each other in different ways. So, you know, it, it, it now doesn't mean we shouldn't be looking at those impacts. But I'm, what I am suggesting, though, is that the technology has been incorporated into our classrooms. It's a really a significant part of the way children, we are providing instruction right now. Um, and to walk away from that will mean many changes in, in the classroom environment. Um, let me just note, if I see lots of, lots of comments here. Um, I, am, I just want to plug my broadband work for a minute. I mean, what we do know is that broadband, uh, in some form, is really essential to everything that we do in our lives anymore. It's the way we get entertainment. It's the way that we, the, we communicate with each other. It's the way we educate. It's the way we organize, organize ourselves politically. How many people here have heard about this event online in some form? Right? And there are many parts of the state that don't have simple broadband which is hard to believe there are more than two dozen school districts that don't have a, a wired connection. Um, they are 37% of our libraries, which is where people go to be able to use technology, don't have 25.3, which is the FCC acknowledged um, speed for residential communities. So we are working hard to try to develop a source of funding that we can really invest in rural communities so that our counterparts who are out in Lake County or uh, out in Mount Hero County can have access to some, some of the basic te technology that allows them to work, to entertain themselves, to keep the next generation uh, at home without leaving, without so them leaving the city. I have a problem about technology being useful in classrooms. I think it's an established Real habit loud, if you would. I think it's an established habit now that technology is useful in classrooms with children. However, being a teacher myself, I don't feel that over the years I've observed that it's that good for the way the brain is wired. No, no, and it's no. wiring brains to miss out on a lot of other kind of learning yes. and coordination of that learning. And I'm a music teacher, so I see the eye muscular uh, coordination lacking. I see the distracted, interrupted thinking. They can't even hold a thought for very long. And it's, it's a definite imposition on these young lives that aren't having a chance to develop normally. So I think we should take the umbrella away. It's very oppressive. I don't care how you do it, by preventative to our health uh, reasoning, or just we don't want to be controlled like this. Talk, I want to make one general comment and then, then go to you on all this. It's back to what Pam mentioned about the inability of local officials or local communities, uh, either city level, state level, to make decisions on any of these technologies based on environmental or human safety concerns. That's pretty amazing. That's unconstitutional. And, uh, well, that, that kind of gets to uh, the point I want to make. How many of you here, I'm sure some of you, have been involved locally with the community rights movement, a national movement uh, that is getting, gaining some traction? And basically it says that uh, we have strayed very far from the principles of Anglo-Saxon law and, um, and protection of the commons uh, through about a century of court decisions that have empowered corporations more and more and more, and that lead to legislation like that that says local communities can't pass laws to protect human safety. So we have a, um, there is a brand new bill that I hope will get a hearing uh, that I dropped last week for a community rights amendment to the Oregon Constitution that, that would also address projects like Jordan Cove. That would say communities can uh, have the right this is oversimplifying some, to impose human health or environmental regulations stricter than the state does, that communities need the power to bring Some would say this is like tilting of windmills. Uh, it's, it's really fundamental to where this country has gotten. But those movements and those proposed amendments exist in different states. I don't believe any states have adopted them. 
but they're being discussed in different states. I think long term, this and may hopefully not too long term, this has as much potential as anything to turn the tide on these kinds of issues and give us control of our communities back. And I, I would uh, raise your hand again if you're knowledgeable about the community rights movement. Go find one of these people if you uh, before you leave. Can I ask a question on that? Yeah. yeah. Um, it has to do with eminent domain because that's a national issue. It's not, but uh, I was shocked when a, a Canadian company mm -hmm. building a pipeline can use eminent domain to run its pipeline to people's property. Yeah. It used to be, and I always said it to be for the community, for hospitals, for necessary, you know, necessary community usage, to, uh, the only time it's going to be used. And it's fundamentally changed. And is there anything we can do at the state level? I don't know the answer to that. Let, let, let me, let's get to people who've really been trying to speak. Can I just people. interrupt because the FCC <laughs> is not following its own guidelines. The FCC standards, which are actually not aligned with European standards, which are much more in a protective mode for the citizenry, the FCC's own guidelines are not being followed by the FCC. So for us to say, well, let's work with the FCC and see what they can provide, it's really tilting at windmill. Yeah. Well, I really, um, I, I, we, don't, we don't want to duck anything, and the bulk of your <coughs> should go to your federal de delegation. Yeah, let's go here. Let's go ahead. Let's go ahead. Uh, I just wanted to say thanks for coming out here and listening um, to me. Uh, preemption is one of the most critical issues facing us, and I understand that the federal government is going to preempt state. You have your hands tied, but there are areas where you don't have your hands tied. If you can get legislation passed that um, where the state is preempting local governments, such as, such as pesticide regulation, um, genetically engineered open air crops. Uh, issues like that where preemption without protection. I'm all for state preemption if you're really going to protect uh, the residents, but here we just adopted an innovative house management plan, right? Um, it's great, but we can only regulate city-owned property and parks, um, which doesn't provide as much protection as we could, and our hands are tied in a community where um, our residents are so passionate about this issue and phasing out Roundup and, and the like. So I just implore you, where you have the control um, and there's no protection for local uh, residents, please don't take away our ability to protect yep. yourself. Yep. <laughs> 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 the public health, uh, after five years of study, Perhaps the greatest threat to public health is the ever-expanding CDC vaccine schedule. Yeah. I want to um, thank you for your support of your voting public. On, uh, <coughs> HB 3063, removing uh, philosophical and religious exemptions to vaccines in Oregon. Uh, we need to um, uphold the, the exemptions, educate for why people should choose them, and even expand exemptions. Um, it's not just uh, pharmaceutical money interests. But there, there's a further agenda with the vaccine poisoning going on in this country and in this world. And, and uh, I've been studying it for five years. We have vaccine refugees here from California because they passed a mandate. Exactly. And at the hearing, you might have seen they, uh, they said they're going to have to leave Oregon now if they take away the exemptions. Exactly. So, uh, and I'm very concerned that pharmaceutical controlled healthcare industry will call the prevention more vaccines. Right. So I think you know how to address that and I'm really glad you're there on that issue. Thank you. I've, I've, uh, I think I've received more credit and more blame than <laughs> I appreciate the support you are making yourselves heard on this. I, I need to be clear that in my Senate district, um, this is 
really has this district split, this issue. Mm -hmm. And there are, you know, part of the part of why this has been so difficult is I have issues where I express strong feelings where the people on the other side may be nice people, but they've got interests and goals that I I don't share and I don't think are good for all of us. The, the climate bill is one example and the people in the fossil fuel industry, they're a lot like that. People who, there are people in this district and around the state who support 3063, the mandatory vaccinations, who are, it's a mixed group, but I've known some of them for many years and um, no small number are public health professionals and doctors who are not in the pharmaceutical uh, corporation's pocket. They are really trying to do what they think is right to protect kids. But that's where their information comes from. Well, yeah, they, and they were, they have also, you know, spent decades in a certain culture and a certain form of education that has not been open to challenging views. And uh, I, I can't think of an issue where um, rational conversation and listening is so difficult. And that's a high bar. There are a lot of issues. <laughs> but people seem really hunkered down and invested. We're in an unfortunate place on this legislation now. There was, a, as you probably know, there were lots of hearings. I think some of you were, I saw some of you in the Capitol during part of this time. There were a number of suggested amendments that would make this uh, a less draconian, less severe bill, more balanced bill. Pam and I worked on one. There were plenty. Um, very few were accepted. They, you know, my view is this has been so, such a rough issue for people. And I got to tell you, there are advocates of this bill who have been threatened on a regular basis, who have people going to their homes on a regular basis. I don't know, regular basis. It's happened. Uh, threatening them. And you know what? That does not quite open their mind to uh, listening to change, proposed changes in the bill. So I, my, my take on this is that people processing this bill really want this issue done with. It's really been unpleasant for them. And, and it doesn't make for a great, uh, uh, great conversation. My, what I've been trying to put forward is it, it's not correct to characterize this as an anti-vaccination versus pro-vaccination. My guess is there are people in the audience who oppose this bill who have pretty different thoughts and opinions about vaccinations. Um, but that's what it that's what it gets boiled down to. Look, don't you know what vaccinations have done for polio and smallpox and you know in some cases measles? And how could you be anti-vaccination? You can say. Any number of times I'm not, could we talk more rationally? But the, the climate isn't there for that now. So um, right now this bill is in uh, ways, the Joint Ways and Means Committee, which means it could go to both floors, House and Senate floor, without further amendments. If that's the case, I'll be voting against it. The point I'll be making is we've abandoned any attempt to achieve balance between the public health concerns of the proponents and the very strong belief of Oregonians in informed consent. This is not the least invasive way to address the measles problem. Yeah. So let's look, and I know I, I mean, said there is no measles problem. I know there's diversity, but um, um, that's what I'll be saying on the Senate floor if it does come to the Senate floor. And you know, Pam has also withstood. Um, Tremendous pressure from the professional health community on this bill. And let, me, let me see if you have anything you want to add. Sure. Well, I'll just put myself out there. Um, <laughs> I I don't have a problem with the science on this. I know that's probably in con contradiction to many of you. I accept the science. I accept the importance of herd immunity. Um, but I think as a community, <laughs> I think as a community um, mandating medical procedure on a child that a parent firmly believes is not in the best interest of the child is, is crossing a line. Um, so that's, that's what the decision I might make today if I'm in, in charge and if somebody else is in charge uh, next time, what are the decisions that they're going to make for me? 
So I, I, and I believe that that is, you know, we are a community where we have a lot of students in our schools that are not adhering to the full vaccination schedule. And Ashland, Siskiyou School, 70% of families um, are not current on their vaccinations, whether that means the whole schedule or one. And the public schools is typically 10 to 20%. That's a lot of our community to really draw a line that pushes people to either have to make a decision that they fundamentally believe is not in their child's best interest or to be ostracized from public school, from daycare, from private school, from school activities, from the high school football game, yeah. feels like it doesn't is not in the best interest of our community. I think ostracizing people and pushing them to the edge is not a good solution. I do think we need to double down on talking about the science and the education and trying to bring us all together in some way that is not so um, divisive for the community. I, I want to say one more thing for, for you, um, that I think is really central to this. I don't think a lot of people, or at least not everyone, knows that this also would apply to private schools. That is, and other states have done this for public schools. I, mean, I don't know that no other state's done it for private schools, but, but we are, um, um, that's really another step in a certain direction. I got a, a memorable call from I'm going to say a highly respected um, health administrator who's been around this issue for a long time. And this person said to me, this is a bad bill, and, but I don't agree with the reasons you've expressed. <coughs> this person said, um, I'm, I, I don't agree with your skepticism about the research of combinations of vaccinations. I think it's stronger than you're saying. And, you know, we should get together because I'd like to talk to you more about that. But the cost to the social fabric of Oregon of passing this bill, of tossing likely tens of thousands of families out of the public and private school system, that cost to Oregon will hurt us badly and ostracize, drive out of really civil society um, tens of thousands of people like that. And that's too big a price to pay, and a bigger price than we need to pay to address what the proponents say is the problem. But I, I think we should be we should be clear. This bill passed out of its policy committee, which was the first big um, barrier. It is in ways and needs. I think it is highly likely that this bill is going to pass. So, although people who are so concerned about it should reach out and, and continue to lobby. The, the places that people can be most effective in lobbying is with their own legislators. So, because we've just been deluged in the Capitol with input from all kinds of people. So, it's going to be hard for you to get an audience with someone who's not your direct legislator, but people in those communities for legislators can continue to talk about this. But I don't think we should, I don't want to leave you with any illusion that this is still an issue that's largely in play. It is not. And if I had to bet, I would bet that it will pass, and we're going to have to figure out how we accommodate to that. How are you going to vote? What? How are you going to vote? Well, if it, the bill is in current form, I'm going to vote now. Jeff, the bill applies to online schools. And these no, it does. That, that online schools out. have been taken out. That 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 also, the other thing I wanted to clarify from the comment over here <laughs> is that the bill is written so that future additions to the vaccination schedule would have to be approved by the legislature. Now, I don't particularly think the legislature is a wonderful place for those decisions to be made, but it was put in there because there was because there was a lot of discomfort with the idea that Oregon Health Authority would independently make that decision. So putting it in the hands of the legislature is the fallback position to that. Yeah, it was, that change was made in response to some of the objections of, you know, bureaucrats behind closed doors are willy-nilly going to be adding to the mandatory list. So they said, okay, well, in full daylight, will pass any expansion of the list, which kind of surprised me because they learned to hate this issue. The last thing they want is to bring this up again and again, but that wasn't compromised. So one more thing about lobbying. I, I, this very well may become law. It's not a done deal. It's in that uh, likely category. So I would, I would really suggest continued lobbying. If you have friends, but not on Jeff and me. Yeah, we're, we're, we're there. Uh, uh, but uh, if you have friends.
friends in other districts. I know there's a statewide organization some of you are involved with. Look at it strategically. Uh, keep going. Please keep the lobbying respectful. This issue has given rise to some really fiery rhetoric which works against your goals. Mm -hmm. Also, if there are things in the bill that could make it better and more tolerable, I know for some of you there, there is nothing, but in other cases, if the medical exemptions, which in Oregon are very narrowly written, um, if a change in those would, would accommodate concerns better, you know, think of ways in which the bill could be marginally improved to, to make it more acceptable. That's more likely to be incorporated than wholesale rejection of the bill. Uh, I want to thank you for your both of your leadership on the uh, mandatory vaccination bill. Uh, Jeff, your testimony was exceptional. Uh, I think everyone that hasn't read his testimony should get it. It's just, it's fine. Uh, when my son was vaccination injured, what I found was I had excellent health insurance. Everything that made my son worse to recover from his injury was covered by insurance. Yeah. Everything that made him better, I paid for out of pocket. Yeah. That's what real medicine looks yeah. like. Yeah. It's authentic, it's traditional, it's safe. The vaccinations are unavoidably unsafe. And my child took a bullet. No. So people can pass a bill based on what? So let me encourage the both of you put together a forum where science can finally get out there instead of being censored by Facebook, censored by Amazon, censored by Adam Schiff. This is what the two of you can do. Let's do a forum so we can really look at the science.
have Senator Richard Blumenthal from Connecticut and Representative Diana Eshoo, who have put the FCC on notice to say, show us the studies and show us that 5G is safe. Finally, something's happening. This is critical. The, the health bills that will go up, I mean, you can look at the military studies from 1971. Can, can I ask you to wrap up because we've got so many okay. things Showing 200 effects, seizures, strokes, childhood leukemia, not to mention bee loss from cell phones, bee colony collapse. So get educated and, and go for the landline and the ethernet and turn your cell phone off when you're not using it and unplug your microwave if you use one and unplug your modem when you're not using it. Okay. Help the children. Stop now. I can't uh, compete with that. Stand up if you would. I believe, I believe in science. I, I am sorry for some people's personal experience that they have had, but I think that a lot of the science that people talk about they, is more coincidence. You know than oh, please. I have my child. Let him speak. People say that um, I had my child vaccinated and this happened. Oh, there must be a, co a coincidence there. Or there must be a correlation that that's the reason that my child had this, these problems. And I don't believe that. I believe that um, there is science that backs up the use of vaccines and that people that don't want to have their children vaccinated, they should accept the consequences of that. You know, that they should accept the consequences and take the responsibility. I don't want my child to be vaccinated, so I'm not going to send him into an environment where he's going to be a threat to other children. I don't want to send him into an environment where he's a threat. You know, come on, parents. Take responsibility for what your decisions are. That's what we wanted to go. One at a time, please. Okay, did you? Go ahead. I, I did, yes. Um, I've been uh, doing some research on health inequality in the Orville Institute and trying and put their information together because they're all professional medical people they don't have a lot of time. I do. I'm not professional. But I have discovered some really interesting things including documentation of I think it's about 50 vaccine patents owned by the uh, CDC. Yeah. I have seen this. I, I've not just read about it. I'm sure I, I, found, it again. I found the links to the actual patent information that the CDC yes. owns. It's not for the uh, the injection itself, it's for all the pieces of, of these injections. You know, the different, uh, the, the delivery, the, in the parts that make it up, okay? The CDC owns these. Some are in, you know, code with other people and so forth. But I have found this. I have also discovered just this morning some really good documentation regarding the, uh, the herd immunity. That's absolutely false. Herd immunity was, was first discovered. I'm sorry, I forgot the guy's name in uh, 1929 or 30 by a researcher, a medical researcher, and he came up with his theory which has been convoluted and turned around to mean, yes, well with the vaccines we'll get herd immunity. That's not what it means at all. I have so much documentation and if you could, um, if I could make sure that you would look at it, I would be happy to share it with you. I'm not going to send you a bunch of wild wow videos. Let me, I, I bet a lot of people want to speak on that. So are there, can, I, can I say something really quick? So this is, to, this is talent. We try to have these conversations in a way where everybody can be heard equally. So I'm just asking, um, ask your questions, make your statements, but please don't interrupt each other or, or the background, because I'm hearing people back there are having a difficult time hearing. I'd ask, I'd ask. So you, you know what, we're a couple more comments on this. Thank you, and I probably have received 5,000 links <laughs> And what, it, what makes this so hard is both sides say the other's documentation is bogus. So like on other issues, we're having trouble getting a common foundation when you talk about a forum, Michael, 
Lord, do I wish I lived on a planet right now where a, where a scientific forum could work and be effective. Uh, and I have some doubts about that. So be, just because there are so many other issues we're working with right now that really affect all of us, I, I would prefer to just take a couple, three more comments on this and, and move on to a couple of other Sir, go ahead. Yeah. God bless America. Uh, and God bless the rule of law. And uh, I know most people put uh, lawyers down, but today I'm uh, God blessing them. And that in the state of Illinois, they have run into situations like this. And they and when they pass laws, they pass laws with the right to sue the state, the county, the city, the individual. And have you uh, considered? putting that into a, a vaccination law, that if somebody, the other day I was in the doctor's office with my uh, granddaughter, she's five, and, and a bunch of people came in there, two or three of uh, 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 people with uh, multiple children, and one of them I, uh, uh, I learned afterwards had the measles. And, uh, but there was a woman in there who had a, a child that was too young to have vaccinations. There were all the other kids, all the older kids were in there to get their vaccinations. And I'm saying that if uh, you don't, if you want to uh, leave your children unvaccinated and send them into a situation like that one lady who didn't know, and, uh, and uh, I don't know what happened to that child, but I do know that, that the kid that was supposed to have uh, measles was walking around and uh, was from this far to that baby that wasn't able to be vaccinated. And uh, could you put in the right to sue an individual so, so that woman's child died and, and she could have a judgment against you for the rest of your life, like she's gonna have to suffer some child, her child dying for the rest of her life. Is, it, is there something like that going right now where you could sue somebody for doing that? I'd like to take two more on this. Is that okay? Yeah. I, I'm having just a sense we may not resolve this issue. <laughs> <laughs> Let me just say, like you said, it's not really about anti-vaccines. It's about what we're allowing the government to control over. I personally don't want to open this door and allow them access to say how many and what can be injected into my child's body. And I know people say just keep them out of school, then homeschool. My kid goes to the store. They go to the library. I mean, are we going to start saying that I have to stay quarantined in my own home? I, I just find this getting excessive. It's getting ridiculous. Measles is something that back in the day, people had like chicken pox and it's like, oh, no big deal. And now it's an emergency. I don't see the state of emergency pushing this. I feel like if if the um, the government is mandating vaccines, then they need. I think that the uh, language is going to be completely changed. If the government mandates vaccines, they are going to be completely responsible for the financial for for paying for those vaccines, and also completely liable for any kind of injury that happens. And I think that the, at the, if that were to happen, the language would completely change. The science would completely change as well as the, the pharmaceutical and the government is taking the responsibility, the financial responsibility of paying for the vaccine and any kind of injury that happens, then we're going to see a different kind of, of reaction and a push through this bill. Let me take a, a quick sense of the room. We have maybe half an hour left. Would you raise your hand if you'd like to um, continue this in an open way and let folks continue to speak to this? Today? Uh, versus, would you like to move on to other topics? One more time. Uh, keep with this conversation. Uh, move on to other topics. Yeah. I think that's what we're going to do. Thank you. We're still open to input. I think you've heard where Pam and I are on this. Uh, there, I think there are probably undecided legislators on this bill. Uh, through, I guess, Oregonians for Medical Freedom, you can find out more about who they are. Keep talking. This, this is not decided. I think Pam, Pam is right. It is more likely than not to pass, but it's not decided. On all, on our, everything that 
issue that really matters to you, keep lobbying, keep contacting your elected officials. Yeah. Yeah, I um, just want to say about another non-profit that lobbying. Just just a little louder. Yeah, they're about to spray uh, pesticide and destructive ice in all the orchards around here, and it gets on the people that live near the orchards. Yeah, they are they're Yeah. So there is a bill right now, not on the first two you mentioned, but I'm not going to dare trying to pronounce this word, or pyrophos. There is a bill that would ban that in Oregon. And, uh, and neonicotinoids, not a ban, but requirement for an applicator's license, like some other, some other uh, uh, chemicals require. Which is to say, you wouldn't see it anymore on the shelves of Walmart and the Grange and whatnot. It, um, the belief at this point, there, there are many of us who would support a ban on neonicotinoids, but the belief is that Oregon's not ready for that, and the sort of middle ground is let it be, make sure it's applied in the right, the right levels and require certification. That's the current bill. Um, there is a really vibrant statewide organization, I think had an office in Phoenix, they still, Beyond Toxics. Yes. Yeah. Are they still there? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So I would recommend going to Beyond Toxics and find out what's going on on those other substances. It, would, well, yeah. it's, it's just too little, too late. We have trucks, tanker trucks, playing, playing the life of state on public roads, unannounced. People jog on it, their pets run on that. Right. The stuff drifts in from the orchards into the school here in town. Area damage is like 200 feet from the I, school. I think your concerns are well founded. Uh, no, but we're saying, oh, the federal government has all of the, the, the cards. Well, can't you insist on notifications, odorizations, and um, fines for drift that, that doesn't require Is there anyone state? here from Beyond Toxics? I know yeah. those people very well. No, okay, good. Can I, can yeah, I have a I, I just wanted to get your sort of um, the um, insight that I've had over the last couple of years working on this. The neonicotinoid bill um, came up two years ago. I was a chief sponsor of that. We didn't get anywhere. In the meantime, we had a big issue over the last two years in Ashland with the misapplication of Crossbow. Some of you know that product. You can buy it at the Grange, and it turns out if you don't dilute it, it will kill everything on adjacent properties when you, when you pour it on your blackberries. Um, a lot of people are interested in the issue of um, Roundup and how that's applied in our communities. And what I've realized is that we have to address, to address any of these successfully, most likely we're going to have to address the whole way that, that Oregon regulates pesticides. Because what we do currently is defer to the EPA. So whatever the EPA says, that's the standards that we accept in the state of Oregon. Now, maybe that was better back in the day when the EPA seemed to actually be looking out for consumers. I'm, I'm not sure it was. They probably are, always had um, lots of different interests at, in mind as they've set regulations. But, what, but Oregon doesn't have to be that way. California actually has its own regulatory system. So what I, I think we need to do, and I've been talking to some of my colleagues in the Capitol, is to really go back and demand that the Department of Agriculture look at different ways um, that we could regulate pesticides here in the state. Because as long as we're deferring to the EPA, when we go in and argue about any one of these products, we don't have any criteria to argue against because it's, we've just accepted what the EPA has said. Um, so we don't, we don't have our own standards. And, and uh, this is parallel to the CDC issue right. as well. Right. And until we um, in Oregon have our own uh, means of assessing significant products, the product lines that are allowed, um, it's going to be a whack-a-mole kind of thing. You know, we're going to be arguing against criteria that we can't even find. <coughs> so it's a it's a big fundamental issue that's going to require um, deep, a deep dive. Mm -hmm. Half the insect population is gone. We're sitting around saying, "Well, what can we do?" Yeah. Uh, Go ahead. Thank you. And thank you very much for representing us. You're doing a fine job. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I've heard a lot of subjects come up this morning that are very poignant to me personally. And I'm about to mention one that probably involves everybody in this room, including you, probably. Um, we've talked about 5G, vaccines, and Jordan Cove, and pesticides, and uh, 
corporate power, raw corporate corporate power, um, specifically Pacific power. And uh, we've probably all got one form of meter or another on our homes right now. Those who you know, have followed suit and tried to use the opt-out options that Pacific Power has offered are not really opt-out options. They're more like extortion. Yep. It's like if you choose to opt out, then they're going to charge you $36 a month for that privilege. And uh, you don't really have a say in that at all. Otherwise, they might just shut your power off if you refuse to go along with it. Well, I, I have refused to go along with that since December, and I'm logged about three or four payments on those $36 a month fees as uh, my so form. you're paying your bill deducting the I'm, I'm deducting that. I'm paying the bill. I'm paying for what I'm getting, okay? And um, so what I'm up against now is the threat by Pacific Power and the Oregon Public Utilities Commission to cut my power if I don't comply. And besides that, I learned just yesterday that I can't, uh, I can't even engage in their new uh, triannual plan, which makes it about $9 a month because they read your meter about three times a year. Okay, that seems like a good way out. However, if you think about that, you're still under duress. You have to pay those fees one way or another. But in my case, they refuse to engage me in that option because I'm protesting with these other three or four fees that I haven't paid, the $36 a month, which was imposed on before there was even a plan by the Oregon Public Utilities Commission for us to have an option. Mm -hmm. So how are they legally doing that and what can we do about that? Somebody here, uh, as we started, was talking about a suit, a lawsuit that was just settled on smart meters. Did, yes, no? I think something has happened very recently. Well, the PUC, yeah, has been high, for some, so, because of the advocacy of many of you, the um, Pacific Power dropped that installation opt-out fee, that initial installation drop-out fee, which was... 137 okay, yeah. So that went away. Um, and then further discussion of the PUC has led to this $9 a month um, option, recognizing that there are some additional costs to reading a meter when you have to send somebody out, um, but that if it's only done once every three months, and, and that'll mean that consumers you know, we'll have to budget for that bigger payment in the in the quarterly uh, at the, on the quarterly schedule. That that's a reasonable accommodation to what it actually costs to send somebody out to read the meter. They don't so, have those figures. What? They don't have those figures. They're guessing. Well, they're they doing. You know, the, the PUC and actually Pacific Power went to the PUC and asked for them to review this option for them to allow them to because the PUC tells the utility companies what they can do. And there is an organization called the Citizens Utility Board, Hub, which is out there for consumers. It's paid for by the state to represent consumers in front of the PUC to review all of these dockets. So the, the Citizens Utility Board has been there looking at this. And I think it is, um, you know, I think the $9 a month has uh, definitely been instituted because of recognition of um, the, the impact of that larger fee. So I think we made really good progress as a result of the evidence. We have, but they're insisting on back fees for the $36 and, yeah, and and I, they didn't engage in that. Yeah, and I'm happy to talk with you later, but I, I don't think I know what the policy uh, on that. One more thing, Bill 3174, what happened to that bill? It was introduced a few days ago, or was going to be. And um, uh, our Jackson County Commissioner, Colleen Roberts, was going to do uh, commentary on that in the legislature until she found out the bill had been suddenly withdrawn. Yeah. And it would have given us the right not to be charged for these meters. It was the right to have a, a analog meter installed at no additional cost. It was withdrawn and I would like you to reintroduce it. Yes.
Go ahead. 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 Go ah
densification of their neighborhoods, more units, more cars, more traffic. Um, it's an issue, and you know that you can make towns more dense, or you can increase urban growth boundaries, let them grow and spread, which has a whole other set of problems to it. So, you know, when, not sure how this, I, I support the bill, I, I expect to vote for it, although it's hard to know how it's going to change before it's done. And, um, you know, we need to, when we talk about solving this problem, a part of this is looking in the mirror. And uh, for many of us, those of us who are comfortable materially and live in kind of nicer neighborhoods that aren't very dense, kind of, um, it means that we're going to see some changes that wouldn't be our first choice, but that is part of solving the affordable housing problem. Can, can I Hang on one second. Go ahead. Um, so, so 2001 enables us to grow within established neighborhoods. So where you already have streets and you already have schools and you already have infrastructure, a single lot might have two units on it or three units on it instead of a single single family home. I think it's important when I talk about this to talk about not only does this potentially contribute to solving the housing crisis as we get more units out there on the ground, I think there's a strong argument to be made that it creates much more interesting neighborhoods to live in. Um, my, my own neighborhood, uh, my house was built in 1905, originally as a family dwelling on a lot over the years. Density happened naturally because that's what people did. They put a cottage in the backyard, they put a unit over the garage, they put a studio in the attic, and now my house is no longer, strictly speaking, a single family residence. But I've got my 90 year old mom living in the cottage, and a couple living in the unit over the garage, and a 19 year old living in the unit over my head. And so, what's not great about having, allowing a neighborhood? to be able to accommodate all kinds of people who wouldn't otherwise traditionally be part of that of that landscape. So I think it's a really important bill. I'm a, I'm a chief sponsor on it. Um, but I just quickly wanted to, to pitch another part of what we need to do to resolve the housing crisis, and that is we need to invest in houses that are out there on the ground, our current housing stock. Because if the current housing start, stock starts to decay, then you've really just exacerbated the problem. And you've committed people to living in units that are not energy efficient, um, not healthy, not sound uh, over the course of their lives. So I've been working hard on that um, realm. I have a number of bills around manufactured housing because that turns out that's a really important sector of our affordable housing stock in, in a naturally occurring way, as well as on bills that would provide energy efficiency incentives to middle class families. Um, and another bill to uh, enable us to invest uh, in critical repairs when we go out to do weatherization and subsidized housing so that people can leave, be left with a home that is actually health, safe, uh, health, uh, healthy, safe, and uh, energy efficient for the long term. So please remember as you think about housing, it's all, it's all these parts. It's the tenant part, it's the new housing part, but it's also how do we take care of people who are out there now and make sure that the homes that they're living in will sustain them. And I'll just to tie two things together, there's probably going to be a fair bit of resources for weatherization of old homes out of the climate bill. That's how some of that money is going to get used. You have been in line for a while. Yes, sir. Thank you so much for being here, and uh, thank you for the opportunity. Would you stand up? I think people would. Sure. I appreciate that. Uh, my, my name is Phoenix Sigalov. Um, I'm a local musician. I'm also a, a chef and I have a, a food truck. Feed hundreds of people in need. Um, first and foremost, though, I am a father. And the issue that I'd like to ask you to shift gears uh, and, and uh, address, if possible, is the issue of parental equity, parental equality, and lives of our children. The current laws in the state of Oregon are particularly difficult uh, with regards to parental equity. Um, uh, the current laws are based upon uh, an antiquated notion that uh, mothers should be f uh, are fundamentally um, uh, caretakers, and fathers are fund fundamentally breadwinners. Um, and the result, overwhelmingly, is that fathers, I, I will say parents in general, but mostly fathers, are marginalized and removed from the daily lives of our children. I'm not talking about bad fathers, I'm not talking about uh, uh, 
abuse of fathers, I'm talking about good fathers who, uh, whose lives are centered around our children. Um, the norm is for people like myself to become every other weekend dads. This results in two to four nights per month that we get to see our children. Um, currently, there, in, in 21 states, there's legislation being considered uh, which takes into uh, uh, presumption 50-50 parenting. Uh, and this has to do with two different issues. One is that of parenting time, and the other is that of, uh, of custody. Custody in the state of Oregon has to do with uh, decision-making ability with regard to religion, health care, and education. Right now, uh, there is a bill brought, uh, or drafted by Senator Thatcher and uh, I can't remember uh, the other gentleman's, uh, the gentleman's name, but working across the aisle uh, and drafted uh, SB 318. 318 addresses parenting time only. It doesn't take into consider consideration custody. Because you just defined it. Yeah. Correct. Um, and my question to you is, would you be willing not only to consider sponsoring Senate Bill 318, but also expanding it to, uh, uh, to broaden the scope uh, regarding custody? Based on what you said, yes, and I know I've heard of it, and not much more than that, and I will get back to you within the long time. Thank you very much. Okay. I have to say that, and we've met many, many times. Um, you know, Oregon, as well as myself, are interested in two bills, HB 2015, which is equal access to the roads, and HB 3004, which I know you're on the committee, uh, small donors election, money coming in to our state from other states that are turning our elections around and on issues and candidates that really concern me because it is not for the betterment of our community. Most of these bills are for the community here as well as in Oregon, and I, I believe people should know about them. So could you say a little bit about it and also give me your opinion on how you would vote? Okay. Uh... I don't know if I can say a little bit about campaign finance. <laughs> uh, to the first one, the driver bill, was that 2015? Yes. Yeah. Uh, I support that bill, and it would, it would um, allow uh, people to get driver's license without proof of citizenship, basically, without identification that is connected to proof of citizenship. No. 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 Yes. 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 No. Yes. No. no. So, my position, one one element of my position is if um, people who can't produce that identification who are not necessarily undocumented immigrants, there are a number of reasons you have trouble getting that ID, are on the roads and driving anyway. They have to survive. They are not stopping because they don't have licenses. I think it's a benefit to have. It's, it's I, I, I just want to say, I mean, that means I could walk into the Department of Motor Vehicles without a scrap of ID and just make up a name and say, hi, I need That's this ID because I can't drive. No. I mean, okay. so you're saying undocumented without proof of who they are. Yeah, I, I don't think you could do that. No. I don't think you get a license. <laughs> because, why? Because I, I live, I'm, I'm American? No. No, because you don't, you would have to produce more identification. Well, so what do these people produce? That's what I, I'm trying to clarify. I'm not, I don't mean okay. to interrupt you. I apologize for that, but I just want to be clear on what we're talking about here. So you would have to produce identification that essentially, directly or indirectly, shows that you have citizenship uh, in order to drive. That's my understanding of the bill. Right. You know no. 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 That's citizenship. Thank you. Thank you. That, that's what I meant. I mean, we don't want undocumented people to have driver's license. That's that's right. that's, that's what the movement is. Um, I I think that's short sighted. And I think I mean we can talk about equity arguments and the whole immigration picture in this country. 
but just just the fact that I would like to that to know that people are behind the wheel are insured and licensed yeah. is what takes me. They know the rules. They know, they the, know rules. the rules of the road. Mm -hmm. So if they don't have licenses and they don't have to get them, then they do not have the rules to follow the road. And it's a safety issue in Oregon. And it's also, if someone hits you, they have to have insurance then. And so you are protected. They cannot get on an airplane because Air, when you go up for your ticket, you know, so they can't fly. So when you go up for your ticket, it shows in the computer that they do not have citizenship. So they cannot go. But they can drive on the road. They can get to their jobs, which they support. They, they pay income tax. They get to their schools and, and other things. They go to your supermarkets, and at least they can go safely. They don't have to be in fear. We have a large population here that is, let's say, undocumented, as well as older people that cannot, do not have birth certificates, you know? Or you go to the fire down in, like, paradise, their birth certificates are So at any rate, that's, that's one of the reasons. Go ahead. Yeah, this might be a good moment. To know that we are going, we are moving quickly as a state toward two tiers of driver's license. Everybody should be thinking about this. There's going to be a real ID, which will cost you more. But if you go in, um, it has a special hologram on it. It's being required by um, the federal government for security purposes. So you'll want that real ID if you travel on a plane a lot. You're not going to need it if what you do is just move around in your community. Then, then a standard driver's license is going to be fine for you. But that real ID will start to be available, I think, next year. Um, so you, know, you can set that on the plane if you have your passport. But be watching out so, because that will apply and, and be an issue for many of you. So what Bev is talking about would be uh, an expansion of the, exist, the, the less um, complex driver's license that would, again, as Jeff said, allow people who can uh, show proof of their residency but not necessarily of citizenship to get a driver's license. And I agree. I think this is a compassionate response, but I also think it's the smartest response. Well, what, you know, what we don't want people safety. What are the, driving, what are the we, requirements for proof of residency? You know, I don't know that I have the answer to that offhand. Does anybody know? Something that establishes the direction. So, again, I think that is the smart thing for us to do to make sure that we have people on the roads who know the rules, have the insurance, um, are really prepared to drive. You know, I recognize uh, an opposition argument to this that, you know, we are encouraging or somehow enabling non compliance with immigration law. And, and so that a lot of people feel that strongly. I would just say about that that our immigration law is. Is a criminal mess right now, and we've got to, that has to be addressed. In the meantime, I'd really like to minimize the number of people driving on Oregon roads without licenses. And there, there is and a if problem. I could add, there is one problem with two two tiers of justice. There's justice legality of American citizens, and then there's the justice of non-American citizens, and they're not being applied equally. Sure. And and that's the same with with a whole lot of things going on in America now. That you know everybody should have to follow the same law. If you're in the United States of America, whether you are a citizen, a politician, a minority, or whatever, if you are in America, we should have one set of laws and rules that apply equally in the justice system. And this bill is just another example of where. There's justice for them, and then there's just us that get to have all of our real exemptions. And that, that, is not, that is not American, it is not constitutional, it is not anything to do with the, with the, uh, the uh, symbol of justice, with you know, the equal weights. It has nothing to do with anything that is constitutional or American uh, tradition. It's and I, wrong. I would, I would argue that what we are doing is setting a standard. Um, setting a different standard for different people. Setting yeah. Yeah. Enabling people to have access to the things they need to, to actually run their lives. But I, I want to make a bigger comment. Um,
Um, you, you, you know, when we talk about the please. Please. Hey, uh, when we talk about this issue, there's a couple things to remember. One is a, a measure similar to this was on the ballot about five or so years ago. Lost badly. Um, we are divided that, on that this issue. That is the same where Oregonian said. No. no, we don't. We uh, don't yeah. want people yeah. without this documentation uh, exactly. to so get licensed. We are divided on this issue, and I would challenge you, those of you who have strong feelings about vaccines or strong feelings about smart meters or 5G, if we don't get to some ability to actually sit and talk to each other about these issues that create such division in our communities and in our state and in our nation, I don't know what happens. So I would challenge I'm you if you have talk. a strong feeling I am about that to, talk. to Sit down. And everybody's telling me to shut up. And actually have a conversation with your neighbors. And a conversation you know, uh, because that's what we're not doing for the young guys and some of the other new. So we have, a, we have about eight or ten minutes. I'm going to say we have hey, 30 we seconds. Wait just a second, please. You're next. Uh, uh, She's talked four times. Well, yes. good. Let, 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 let's go. Let, stop. If you're please, jealous. Stop. You can get into the We've had session this morning. Let's uh, please. So, uh, I, because of time, I'm not going into campaign finance reform. It's why I ran for office, because I doubt that any of these issues are solvable unless we can get a grip on money in politics. There's, yes. a, there's, yes. a, lot, there's a lot going on. This could be an historic session. I will pitch my newsletter once again at my legislative site because I'm really focusing on that issue in the newsletter. And there's people who've really been patient with their hands up, uh, and I want to try to get them. You have spoken. Can you be really brief so I can get to I can, yeah. I just want to say that, well, first of all, thank you for being here and being open to listening to all sides. I do appreciate that a lot. Okay? Well, the thing is, we voted on that giving driver's licenses to undocumented people. We voted no. So why, when we vote on something, does it just get, oh, we're just going to take that, we're going to do it again? Like, we're, why don't our votes matter? Well, that was five or six years ago. So I think there's a sense that all, all issues need to be revisited. That's what we voted. Yeah, sometimes they're, they're, things are voted down because they're not wholly complete and they can be modified to be better. Yeah, it's, it's a dynamic process. The great majority of things people vote on. Uh, the legislature leaves it at that. If there's something that they think is pressing, we who are elected do go ahead and sometimes change it, rarely. And if folks don't like that, you, you have a recourse too, of course. Both electing other people and putting something back on the ballot. Senator, it's, um, yes. such a short time. Can I point out two people that have their hand up? Yes, please. That would help. This gal here and the guy over there in the white shirt has been raising their hand through the whole thing. Thank you. Yeah. You're next. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to And I think I have a concern about uh, tilting at, at the windmills when we're, when we're overlooking uh, real rights and real powers that we're not exercising. I don't think that there's anywhere where you can show me where communities have rights. I mean, we, individuals have rights. Every individual in this community has a right. So collectively, we have a right. But, but communities as, a, as an entity do not have rights. And I think it's a slippery slope. Um, I think that um, we're, for example, in one uh, community right, uh, I mean not community, I mean uh, one right that we're overlooking is a federal law requiring coordination. So anytime the federal government does anything in a, like, in a uh, local region, they, they must, it shall. That's a legal term saying yes, they will have to coordinate. And hardly any communities ever require that. And uh, Jackson County is just now doing that on the fire issue. They're requiring coordination with the federal government because they have actually done their own study to find out. I mean, I was talking about uh, coordination as it relates to 5G, the pipeline, all of that stuff. We are overlooking an amazing tool here. Um, the, County, Jackson County has just proved that over the fire issue because they have uh, demanded coordination and they have also done their own assessment on the uh, roadmap to 2020. The CCRI uh, determined that all these wildfires, the catastrophic wildfires that we've been experiencing, are the result of climate change. Yeah. And yet, the county has done their own study and came, came up with the conclusion that it is the 1995 letter for federal policy that has dictated these categories.
catastrophic fires. Mm -hmm. And so they are they're now changing their relationship with the federal government in terms of, so hopefully this fire season will be better because um, they, they're going to call for full, full suppression, which is one of the aspects of the results of that. And that let it burn policy must be, must be dealt with. So now, Jackson County, or Jackson County, went to the National Association of Counties, and they filed a they voted on a resolution that at, that the federal government will coordinate with each individual county on an individual basis, not a blanket policy on fire anymore. Because we've seen the whole West has seen the devastating results of that. Again, have, so these are these are examples that have been proven to be powerful. So, you know, and yet, you know, there's, and yet there are things where you're, you guys are overstepping your boundaries in terms of what you're supposed to be looking at. We have powers we're not using as individuals, as communities, and we have, we, and then yet the state, later, state, state legislatures overstepping their boundaries. So, so if I may, real, real on, quickly. On HB 2020, you have Article 11, uh, Section 1 of the Oregon Constitution clearly states you cannot set up a cap and trade system. Oh, see, now I'd like to hear more about that. That's the first I've heard that one, so let me know. But let me, if I may, really quickly, the issue of coordination has constitutional lawyers fighting for at least 20 years and be interested in more conversation at some point. But about fires, I, I do want to push back a little against the notion that what we're experiencing now is either all climate or all forest management issues. We've got, um, we are, Pam and I and others are really committed to 2020 and setting up a, a, an example for uh, emissions reduction policies that work because we can do the greatest forest management ever and that's not going to solve this over time. And we both have, Pam more than me, and I wish we'd had time to talk about it, I think some really interesting proposals on forest health and fuel reduction that could make a major difference. Why? And we really have to be doing two tracks. Can I ask a question on the, on the climate change? Why is it that I don't see anything, anywhere, on any website about geoengineering? About what? I'm going to interject quickly. You don't know me, but I'm Adam. I work for Senator Golden. I have a legislative team. I just want to say that we're almost out of time, so we really only have time for one more question. Uh, and the gentleman in the white shirt has been waiting. However, if you still have questions, you can come see me or our intern, Luke. We have business cards with our phone number and our email on them. We also have some index cards if you'd like to write down your question, and we'll get back to you on them. Thank you.
several moving pieces, but we could, we could talk more. And I'll just add quickly, um, so the pieces to that in terms of Oregon are Oregon Health Plan, so we're maintaining the number of people in Oregon Health Plan. I think you will also be hearing about proposals to expand, to allow other entities to buy into that model. Um, and there's a lot of good things that can happen in doing that. Uh, it's, it's an opportunity to really expand the emphasis on prevention that we developed in, in the coordinated care model. However, if the Affordable Care Act really goes away, um, people who have been buying into that system are going to be cast off. We, we do not have, we, in this state, we can work as quickly as we can to expand OHP and to allow people to buy in. Um, we can mandate that people have health insurance, because frankly, that's one of the ways that we keep the risk down. But what we don't have is the financial capacity to provide the subsidies and those tax credits that have allowed many of you to buy into the Affordable Care Program. I have four kids, three of them get subsidies through insurance plans that they, they buy on, on the market. They have a level of subsidies available to them. Without those subsidies, um, I, the market changes completely. Right. So it's, it's a huge threat and one that, although we're doing our best to catch up with, that really tanks, um, we're going to have a crisis moment.